Acts chapter 20 in your Bibles, please. And by the way, if again, for those of you who are new, if it seems a little odd that I have been up here doing too much this morning, uh, that wasn't the plan, but our other pastor, Pastor Eric True, uh, came to church this morning and was just feeling, he, he was had international travel and was on the other side of the world till the middle of this week, and he just felt terrible this morning and had to leave and go home. So we've uh, just been trying to cover some gaps for him. All right, for a few weeks now, we have been studying Paul's farewell address to the pastors of the church at Ephesus, looking at several different aspects of it. And so we've talked about Paul, we've talked about pastors, we've talked about the church, dangers from within and without. And today we want to consider what this passage tells us about God and the greatness of His love for us. That is, of course, the most important aspect of the text. Um, I didn't leave it kind of for last because it's not important, but because it really helps to have a grasp of the passage as a whole and then focus on what it tells us about God. So even though this is titled The Church's Importance, Each point will be about God and what He has done, because our importance comes from Him, from His love, from the value that He places on His people. God is the Creator, and so whatever whatever He deems to be important is important. You know, whatever He values is valuable, and this passage shows us that the church is of immense importance to God, and because of that, He is constantly acting on behalf of the church. I think we can say it this way, other than God himself and his glory, there is nothing more important than his people, the church. And remember when we say that, that those who are born again in Christ are the church. So this church that we're referring to is not something out there somewhere. It's you. It is us. If Jesus has saved you, The church's importance is our importance. So let's consider six ways in which Paul's farewell address teaches this. And admittedly, we're not exactly following the order of the text, but following an order that relates to what God has done. Number one, God has taken us as his own. So if we look in Acts 20, at verse 28, um, Paul tells these pastors to Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God which he obtained. Now, we'll talk about obtaining it with his own blood in a minute, but just focus on those words, the church of God which he obtained. Many, use, many translations use a word like purchased or bought Um, because we can obtain something we didn't mean to get. (laughs) Somebody can, you know, drop something off at your house that you didn't really want or something like that. That is not the idea here. This is something very intentional God did and even something that involved a price. He purchased these people to make them his own people. He obtained a people and those people are called the church. Now, why are they called the church? Is that just a human term? Just kind of a a word that's developed across time and culture to describe buildings or religions or denominations or something? It's actually a Bible word. It's God's word to name his people. Now, there are many other things we could say about God's people. They are redeemed and they are sanctified and, and they are forgiven. But in terms of a name for God's people, the Bible name is the church. So why that name? Well, God, it's, it's remarkable that God chose the name that means gathered. God's people are known as the gathered ones. And we could also say the gathering ones. They are the people whom God gathered together as his own people. They're not just a bunch of saved individuals, but God has gathered them together. And as a result, they are the gathering people. They gather together themselves because God has gathered them together. That's actually what the word church tells us. The people called out by God and gathered together to be his people. God has taken us as his own. 
Now, for each of these six points today, I'd like us to also hear what Paul wrote to the Ephesian church about these things. Since Paul was speaking to the pastors in Ephesus, it's very helpful to go see the parallels in the letter to the church at Ephesus, and the parallels are incredible. Uh, The parallels between the book of Ephesians and Acts 20 are really remarkable. So many connections that I didn't include them all in your sheet, and we can't look them all up. So you see, if you just look at your handout, you see the number of references to Ephesians on there. I mean, you're welcome to try to turn to all those, but I'm going to go fast. I'm just going to quote those to you um, because there's so much here. So I think you'll just want to listen and kind of soak in what else we learn. It's it's kind of like Ephesians is a commentary on Acts 20 that, that fills out these themes. So our first point here is that the church is important because God has taken us as his own. And Ephesians just bursts with that truth. It says that God predestined us for adoption to himself, that we are beloved children, that we are fellow citizens with the saints. We are members of the household of God. We have access to the Father. All of those are expressions of God taking us as his own people. Ephesians says that we are members of Christ's body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. We are a holy temple built on Christ the cornerstone. We are a temple where God dwells by his spirit. And as we saw earlier, it is through us and the church that God will receive glory forever and ever. This is true for the entire church But it was also true of the church in Ephesus. That particular church was precious to God. Our particular church is precious to God because he has obtained us as his own people, gathering us to himself and then gathering us together with one another. So number one, God has taken us as his own. That's one way we see the church's importance. A second way, number two, God has given us a great savior. Again, verse 20 8 calls us the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. Now, in a sense, that point would actually, could actually go before point one. You know, the only way it's possible for us to become God's own people is for him to give us a great savior. The verse says that he obtained the church with his own blood. The cost was death, and that price could only be paid by God himself. I, mean, I think you can say there's a way in which we could pay the price for sin. Um, but the way in which we can pay the price for sin is apparently a separation from God for eternity in hell. And so there's no way for that to happen and, and us to become part of God's people. Those things are, are mutually exclusive. And so the only way God could take us as his own was for somehow our, the wages of sin, the physical and spiritual death that, that sin merits, that had to be paid. And there's no human who can pay that price. There's no way we can pay that price. God had to accomplish it through the death of the son. He, the son was the sacrifice, like a perfect lamb who bore the penalty for our sin. So for us to become God's people he would have to give us a great savior, or as the verse says, he would have to obtain us with his own blood. So Ephesians says that in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Once we were far off, but now we have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Romans 8 says that God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Our great Savior, according to Ephesians, has been made the head over all things for the sake of the church, which is his body. Did you hear that? He's head over all things for us. It says that Ephesians refers to the unsearchable riches of Christ for us. It refers to his love as broad and deep and long and high and surpassing knowledge. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Over and over again, it's a great Savior. We have a great Savior, and the greatness of the Savior shows us the importance of the church. Because, well, this is tricky, right? In theory, if we spend a lot of money on something, we just bought something valuable. However, we have all spent a lot of money on something that was not in the end valuable, (laughs) and we wished we had not spent all that money on. God never makes that mistake. When God 
invests in something. When God pays a great price, he obtains something of great value. So surely the church has great importance. God has given us a great Savior. Now, we're talking about the generosity of God the Father in giving us a great Savior, but Acts 20 also talks about the generosity of the Savior. It's down in verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The Father gave us a great Savior, but that great Savior himself is a great giver. The Bible says that he gave himself for our sins. He gave himself for us to redeem us. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Paul wrote to the Ephesian church and reminded them to walk in love as Christ loved them and gave himself up for them. Christ gave himself for us. And as we'll see in a moment, he continues to give, us every, give to us every day by the Spirit. And God's plan is to keep giving to you in Jesus throughout the ages to come. The generosity is not going to end. God has given to his church a great Savior who is himself a great giver. So the church's importance, number one, God has taken us as his own. Number two, God has given us a great Savior. Number three, God has given his spirit to work in and among us. There are so many benefits of the presence of the Spirit, so many references to the Spirit in Ephesians. Um, but we're going to keep our focus on just the one aspect of the Spirit's work that is highlighted here in Acts 20, verse 28. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. He's talking to pastors, right? To the elders. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Hmm. How did they become pastors in Ephesus? Well, the ultimate answer was the Spirit of God. There was a lot of human involvement, wasn't there? Someone led them to saving faith in Christ. Someone helped them grow in the faith. Maybe somebody like Paul or Aquila or Apollos recognized their gifts and mentored them. There was some process by which they were chosen and appointed as pastors. There was a lot of human involvement, yet behind it all was the Spirit of God taking care of the church. The Spirit called those pastors to himself. The Spirit convicted them of sin. The Spirit opened their eyes to see Jesus as their Savior. The Spirit strengthened that new church to disciple them. The Spirit gifted and equipped them for ministry. The Spirit led the church to appoint them as pastors. Part of what's remarkable here in the language of Acts 20:28 20, is that Paul uses the same language here that he uses when he talks about Jesus appointing him to apostleship the same work of the risen Christ by his spirit that appointed these pastors. It looks like a human process, yet carrying it all along is the spirit. And since the spirit is carrying out the works of Jesus, it's Jesus crucified, risen, sitting at the father's right hand, who is taking care of his church through the spirit. A couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to be with about 150 other pastors at a fellowship in Florida. And it just gave me great joy to talk to pastors from Argentina, Mexico, Canada, Puerto Rico, every corner of the United States, Alaska, Hawaii. They, these men carry a heavy responsibility from God. Who signs up for this? We, you saw that the last two Sundays, right? And the pastor's responsibility. Why do those men have a heart for God? Why do those men have a heart to shepherd the flock of God? It's because there's been a long work of the Spirit of God in their hearts. And why would the Spirit of God do that? Because he takes care of his church. Because it's important. They exist because the church is important to God. Last week, I received an email from a, uh, a pastor's wife in a fairly remote city in Eastern Australia. She's listening to our sermons online. And she just sent us a note to say hi. And so I looked up, you know, where, where is this pastor and his wife? And I mean, it's a city of, I don't know, 30,000 people or something, but it's really not near anything in Eastern Australia. Isn't it sound just like something God would do 
to raise up a pastor to shepherd the flock of God in a place that none of us have ever heard of in Eastern Australia? Isn't that what God's doing all around the world today? He's taking care of his church. And the book of Ephesians confirms this. Paul says that he was an apostle by the will of God. He was made a minister of the gospel according to the gift of God's grace given by the working of God's power. It says that the resurrected Jesus gave gifts to the church, including pastor teachers. So we see the church's importance as we see how God has given his spirit to work in and among us. Now, we're focusing on one area of that, right? The provision of pastors, since Acts 20:28 20, says that the Spirit does that. But we could continue on with all of the other ways in which the Spirit cares for the need of the church because he actually has gifted everybody in the church family. Every one of you is a gift of the Spirit to the church. And some of you believe that, And some of you don't, and you need to repent of your faithlessness, and you need to believe that, that every one of you is a gift of the Spirit for the church. He's caring for the church through you. And you say, no, I'm one of those people who needs the care of the church. Yes, you are. This is the way it works. Everybody needs the care of the church, and everybody is used by God to care for the church. That is the way it works. The Spirit has gifted every one of you because God loves the church. And so we see the church's importance because God has taken us as his own, given us a great Savior, given his Spirit to work in and among us. Now, number four, God is. So we move now even more into the present moment. God is building us up through the word of his grace. Some of you might have lived in a neighborhood where there was a controversy at some point about renters. I don't know if any of you have ever been in that situation, but the stereotype, though you know, sometimes an accurate one, is that renters won't take care of a house the same way. I, I remember when we bought our house here in Menifee Lakes, I remember the, the, the neighbor coming right over and saying, so you guys just renting, huh? Like, no, we bought it. You bought it? He was just sure that we were somebody he wasn't going to like because we were here to rent in their neighborhood. Uh, But, you know, the perception is that renters are only going to be there for a short time and it's not their house, so they don't have the same sense of responsibility and they're not going to take care of it. And, of course, that happens sometimes. So it's not entirely a false false stereotype. But my point is just that you know what it's like to see a house that it seems like they don't care about. You can tell they're not taking care of it. And whether it's because they're renters or because they've gotten really sick and they can't even get out to take care of it or because they're just you know, caught up in substance abuse and aren't able to, you know, be thinking clearly to take care of it or whatever the case may be. You see a house that's not being cared for and you wonder, why don't they care about that? Why don't they take care of it? It's falling apart in disrepair. The church of Jesus Christ is not like that. God keeps building it up. See Acts 20, verse 32. And now... I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. God builds up the church by the word of his grace. Now that phrase, the word of his grace, means the Bible's message about the grace of God. The Bible's message about all of God's kindness and good, goodness to us in Christ. Of course, Ephesians is full of the word of grace. It begins with grace to you in chapter 1. It lays out the glories of God's grace in chapter 1. Chapter 2 teaches that we have been saved by grace, not of ourselves, not of works. The book ends with a blessing of grace for all those who love Jesus. So those truths about God's grace in his word have power to keep building us up so that our lives and our church is not in disrepair. They strengthen us as we follow Christ. Now, to be more specific, God builds us up by the word of grace through the Spirit, right? The Spirit uses the Word of grace. Ephesians says that the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Sword is a different image, of course. You don't build with a sword. But we could just as easily say the Word of God is the hammer and nails and sandpaper and glue and paint of the Spirit, right? With which he builds up. The Spirit uses the Word of grace to build up the church. Now, to be even more specific... 
God builds us up by the word of grace, through the Spirit, through what goes in that blank. Who goes in that blank? God builds us up by the word of his grace, through the Spirit, through you. Ephesians says it over and over again. The church is built up by the church. The church is built up by its own people as they take the word of grace and give the word of grace to each other. And through that encouragement, the church is built up. It says the body builds itself up in love. The saints are equipped for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ. Speak only those things that are good for building up. God builds us up by the word of his grace, through the spirit, through his people. But what's the real point of all this? The importance of the church. God doesn't leave his church in disrepair. All right, now, who wants to argue about that? Because it's easy to argue about that. Because you can look around and say, I've seen some churches that were disasters. I don't think God was taking care of them. So how can we put those two things together? We have all seen churches in disrepair. And God always takes care of his church. Well, I would suggest two, it's probably a long answer, but two basic things. Number one, there are false churches. God doesn't take care of them. He opposes them. So there's that. But second of all, what we learn from Revelation 2 and 3 is that God closes churches. The way it's pictured there is he puts their lamp out. Now that's not getting rid of his people, the church, but it's talking about individual churches in particular places and particular times who become spiritually unhealthy to such a degree that the best thing for them and for the church is for that local church to no longer exist. God is actually resisting that local church and their pride and the growth of false teaching there or whatever it may be that's going on as we see reflected in those letters to the churches in Revelation 2 and 3. You know, we have a We have a surgeon with us here this morning. A surgeon's job is to build people up. And yet, frankly, this guy takes uh, a lot of things out of people. Right? He removes things. Is that because he's not building them up? No, it's because sometimes what's healthiest is for there to be some removal. It looks like disrepair. I mean, the very nature of a surgeon is to do disrepair for the purpose of building up that body. And so, yes, we sometimes look around and we see disrepair in the church of Jesus Christ. God is always caring for his church. Sometimes he does that through surgery. Sometimes he does that by closing churches. But God is always building up his church through his word of grace. And can I just set aside that theme for a moment and say, I am so praising the Lord that he got us to Acts 20 right now at this time in life of our church. Right when he, we have, he brought us another pastor and we have new members and these different things are going on. I didn't plan this. There was no master plan to get us to this text. And yet there is hardly a richer text in the New Testament about God the Father, the work of God the Son, the work of the Spirit in the church. It's, I just keep shaking my head in wonder at this, that God... God did this. Now, why did he do that? Because he's caring for this church by his spirit, through the word of his grace. This sermon is full of the news of God's grace, isn't it? Isn't this all about God's goodness to his church, to us? God is using the word of his grace in this moment to build you up because he cares for the church. The church is important because God has taken us as his own, has given us a great savior, has given his spirit to work in and among us. He is building us up through the word of his grace. Number five, we see the church's importance when we see that God is keeping us safely. Verse 32 again, Acts 20, 32, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. You might circle three key words in there. The word commend, the word able, and the word inheritance. We've already studied the word commend in a previous week. 
That word means to entrust for safe, safekeeping. To entrust for safekeeping. Each one of us has been entrusted to God for safekeeping. The second key word is able. God, through his word, is able to keep you safely. If you, uh, some of you have guns, some of you have bought gun safes. If you buy a gun safe, one of the things on the box is its fire protection rating. What is that? It's, it's measured in minutes, right? How long can this thing withstand fire before your guns get damaged? So what is God's fire protection rating? How much ability does he have to keep you safely? How long can he do that? Ephesians talks about the immeasurable greatness of his power, the working of his great might, his ability to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. God is able to keep us safely and he is able to keep us safely forever and he is the only one able to keep us safely forever. As we sing, I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold. He must hold me fast. Ephesians has this beautiful section in chapter 5 where Paul writes that Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself holy and without blemish. We have a great Savior who will keep us safely until we are presented to him in holiness. So the first key word is commend. The second key word is able. God is able to keep us forever. The third key word is inheritance. God is keeping us for our inheritance. We're being kept for Christ's sake. We're also being kept for our sake. Ephesians says that in Christ we have obtained an inheritance. We are sealed by the Spirit for the day of redemption, and we are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. The guarantee. God's purpose from the beginning was to give us all things in Christ. He will complete that work. He is keeping us safely. Now, the main point we're making here is about the importance of the church. God is keeping us safely because the church is very precious to him. Parents, you know what it's like to wish that your kids would learn to keep things safely. They beg for a particular Christmas present, and then they don't take care of it when they get it. You say to them things like, How could you lose that? How can you not know where that is? We say things like, if you actually cared about that, you would keep track of it. You would take care of it. Your little sister's one. And so if that's important to you, don't leave it on the floor because she's one. (laughs) Now, I understand to not be too hard on the kids. I understand that's partly our human weakness, right? Adults, you struggle to care for things as you should. Most of you, I do. It's partly just immaturity. They're kids, you know, they're excited about the next thing to go on to. I understand that. It's partly commercialism that makes things look much cooler in advance than they are when you actually get them, you know, and then they're not so worth caring for. It's partly that they did receive it as a gift sometimes and so they don't actually know how hard you have to work for $100 to buy that thing. Um, so I know it's complicated, but my, but, but my point is just that common parental thought. If that was actually important to you, you'd take care of it. God is keeping us safely because the church is so important to him. You know, it's interesting too that some kids, and maybe it's personality or something, I don't know, but some kids have something that is very precious to them and they do keep it safely. You know, like they can't go to bed at night until they know that thing is in its place in their room or the world ends if it's not in its place. I I think God's love for the church is a little bit like that. Number five, God is keeping us safely. And then finally, number six, God has revealed his whole purpose to us. This is verse 27. 
where Paul told the pastors that he had not shrinked from declaring to them and to the church the whole counsel of God. And as we we learned earlier, the word counsel is just the word for God's will or God's purpose. So this is referring to the whole purpose of God. The big picture of what God has revealed about his plans and works through Jesus. God wants you to know his whole purpose. That, That doesn't mean that he tells us every detail, but he tells us the whole picture of his purposes. Eternity past, in the present, through Christ, in the future, his whole purpose is laid out in his word. His whole purpose is laid out in his word for you so that you'll know it. He wants you to know it. So how many people are there in your life about whom you would say, I tell that person everything? How many people in your life do you tell everything? Some of you might name one person, two people. Maybe there's somebody here who would name three people. Some of you would say, "Uh, that's zero. There isn't anybody in my life to whom I would tell everything. So do you realize then the importance of the fact that God reveals his whole purpose to us? God wants you to know, to understand his heart, his ways, his purposes, his plans, his works in the past, in the present, in the future, what he's going to do. It is because you are precious to him. It's all over. <laughs> just, I, I can't go through all the references, but just read, read the book of Ephesians and look for the idea of God's purpose in the book of Ephesians, and it's, it's everywhere. Ephesians talked about how God talks about how God called us and chose us and predestined us according to the purpose of his will. He talks about his purpose, his plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in Christ. It talks about the mystery of Christ, the one people of God from Jew and Gentile together. It talks about the plan that was hidden from the ages but has now been made known, the eternal purpose fulfilled in Jesus. Um, it says that he works all things according to the counsel of his will is the same word as Acts 20. Ephesians also says this. It also says that God has opened your eyes to get it. That's my own words a little bit, but that's what Ephesians 1, 17 through 19 teaches. That God not only revealed his will for you, but he actually did something in your heart to open your spiritual eyes so that you would see it and understand it. And he continues to do that. He continues to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him because he wants you to know him and know his ways. And then Ephesians also says some really encouraging specific things about God's purposes for us. And Paul keeps talking about our calling, the hope of our calling, the purposes of our calling. He says that God has blessed us in the heavenly places in Christ with every spiritual blessing, but we got to turn over to Ephesians together now and read one section. So will you turn there? We're going to go to a famous section. For some of you, it's very familiar. But I hope you might see it with fresh eyes today because we're talking about the importance of the church to God the importance of the church because of God, because of what God has done and is doing and will do. Just look at how this passage wraps that together. Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 10. What does this tell us about the importance of the church because of God and what he has done, is doing, will do? Ephesians 2, verse 1. And you were dead dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Wow. How important is the church to God? There's a lot there, but I think verse 7, for our purposes today, verse 7 is the centerpiece of it. In the coming ages, he is going to show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ. As a matter of fact, see the words at the beginning of verse 7? So that he was kind to you before so that he can be kind to you forever. That's his purpose. God gave to us in the past. He gave us a great Savior, his own Son, that he might redeem us and obtain us as his own people. He gave his own blood for our sin. He gave his Spirit to us. He gave the word of his grace to us. He gave his whole purpose to us. He gave us pastors and he gave us gifts and he gave us the whole church to build us up. He has given and given and given again and he continues to do so right now through the risen Christ, yet he's just getting started. In the coming ages, he's just going to keep on giving. He's got immeasurable riches of grace you haven't even seen yet. And he's just going to keep pouring out Christ's kindness on you forever. So how important is the church to God Let no one say, I love Jesus, I just don't love the church. Now, I know, I know that some people say that because they've been hurt by a specific church or by specific people in the church. I understand that that's why some people say it, and so they need gentle care and patience. I understand that. But there is just no way to truly love Jesus and truly not love the church. It's impossible. Because he loves the church. It is his body. It is his people, the ones he has gathered together. The church is so precious to him. Now, of course, I want us to love the church. And maybe you need that challenge today. (laughs) Maybe you need the challenge today to love the church of Jesus Christ because he loves the church. But that's not actually our point this morning. The point is for us to be built up by the word of his grace, strengthened by the good news of his kindness to us. Are you at all encouraged to remember that God has taken us as his own, that God has given us a great savior, that God has given his spirit to work in and among us, that God is building us up right this moment through the word of his goodness, his grace? Are you encouraged to know that God is keeping us safely, to remember that he has revealed his whole purpose to us and it is eternally amazing what he's planning to do for us? Has the word of his grace built you up? That's him working because he cares. This is the church's importance. This is Grace Bible Church of Menifee's importance. Maybe someday God will put this lamp out. And if he does... That will be the best thing. But he hasn't right now. (laughs) And so we can with confidence say, these things are true of this church. These things demonstrate the value to God of this church. And pastors at every faithful church in Menifee and Marietta and Temecula and Lake Elsinore and Hemet and San Jacinto and Moreno Valley and Riverside and Corona and could all say the same thing to their church families this morning. Isn't that cool? May we be built up by these things. Father, we praise you for giving us a great Savior. We praise you for giving precious value to us when we didn't have it in ourselves. We praise you for forgiving us. We praise you for bringing us into union with Christ. We praise you for bringing us into union with one another. We thank you for reminding us today that you're taking care of us. So we rest in you. Nothing in our hands we bring simply to the cross we cling. We rest in you for you are our great God and you have given us 
a great shepherd in Jesus Christ. I pray in his name. Amen.